Oh yeah, mm -hmm. it's working now. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So um, just looking at the time. So yes, I'll I'll just speak for less than thirty minutes. Not so so long because I want to have time for discussion and questions. Um, and what I want to cover in those thirty minutes is actually five topics. Uh, I'm going to take you through a little bit about the global trends that are affecting investment today in climate. Then I'll talk a little bit about climate solutions. These are the products, uh, the businesses that people are investing in. Uh, then the heart of the, the heart of the presentation is the strategies that investors use to make those investments. And then I'll conclude with what about climate change and will we avoid what's called catastrophic climate change? And include what, 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 with what this means for investors, what the implications are for investors. But before I start, I just need to take us back in time a little bit, all the way back to 1988. And uh, this is testimony that was given to Congress by, uh, by James Hansen. And Hansen was the first scientist uh, to really warn people, warn Congress in this case, about climate change. Uh, and um, he was at Columbia University, and he was pretty clear at the time, and as were other scientists, that uh, climate change would become a very serious matter. So this, you know, we've been we've been dealing with this issue for 35 years now, but only recently have investors actually uh, been participating in investing in climate solutions. And the reason for that is another another quote I have to give you. <laughs> Um, and this one is from a, not from a scientist. This is from Mark Carney, who was governor of the Bank of England when he made this quote in 2015. And it's a lecture that he gave at Lloyd's of London. And in that lecture, he called climate change that is the tragedy of the horizon. And what this means is it's a play on the words tragedy of the commons, which is an economic term that refer to economic problems like climate change. What he meant by tragedy of the horizon is that the impacts of climate change, he says in this quote, the impacts of climate change are way in the future. They'll felt, will be felt beyond the traditional horizons of most actors, putting a cost on future generations that the current generation has no direct incentive to fix. In other words, for investors, and he goes on in his speech to talk more about this, he says for investors, most investors have a 10 year time horizon at most. Most investments are no more than 10 years. Some are much shorter. And most politicians think maybe three or four years in the future, they think about the next election. And he said the problem with climate change is it's not in three years or 10 years, it's going to be in 30 years or 50 years. And therefore, investors today have no incentive to actually address climate change. And so for many years, investors were not active. They, they could not invest capital to address climate change, it wasn't really realistic. But that has changed. And the reason that has changed are several global trends that are changing the behavior of investors. And I just wanna spend a minute on those trends. So the first is what we call a manifestation of fiscal risk. What this means quite simply is that climate change is now becoming uh, something that people can, uh, it's something that people experience. And this is a, this is a global trend that's, that's not a good trend, it's a terrible trend. But in some ways it's helpful because until pretty recently, climate change is really a theoretical idea. And it's very hard to get people to change their behavior around a theoretical risk. You know, this is coming in the future. Actually that theoretical risk today is becoming quite real. And uh, I could have put up a picture of the, the wall, you know, the fires in Canada, which are very severe and affected the northern U.S. or heat in uh, in India or, or or many countries today. So this is now getting a lot of attention. That people are starting to experience the physical risks of climate change, and because of that, we have a second trend we call evolving social norms. Greta Thunberg is a climate activist; she's well known, but it's not just her. Uh, Many people, particularly younger people, people like Gustavo, um, are starting to really care about climate change. And they're caring because they're, they realize that it's gonna be a problem they will have to deal with in their life. And so we start to see uh, younger people 
actually um, taking action around climate change and starting to care about this issue that no one cared about until recently. And because you have evolving social norms, you start to have government action. Since government tends to respond to, to social, you know, when social norms change, government changes as well, because they like to stay, uh, stay in power. And uh, we have many governments, not every government, uh, but many governments now starting to take action on climate change. This is just one example. The Inflation Reduction Act, the bill that was passed in the US to address climate change is a very, very large um, government action on climate change. But many, many governments in the world today are now starting to take action on climate change, depending a little bit on the political situation. So those are three very clear trends that we see recently. But the most important trend is around innovation. And uh, I show uh, Tesla's electric car here is just an example of innovation. It's not just electric cars. We have innovation in solar power and in wind power, in um, uh, energy storage, and in many, many other sectors. To give you an example, when I began working on climate change, this was 20 years ago, 2002, 21 years ago, um, there was very little innovation to address climate change. There were no electric cars, no electric vehicles. Uh, renewable energy, we'll say wind and solar, was very expensive uh, and not a good substitute for, um, for fossil fuels. There really was little to invest in. Today, that's completely different. The amount of innovation that's currently available to investors is remarkable and, and it's continued to grow very quickly. So because of these first four trends, the fifth trend is the reaction of investors. And this is a quote from uh, Larry Fink of BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager. And as he writes, in the near future and sooner than most anticipate, there will be a significant reallocation of capital. What he's saying is that investors are now starting to pull money away from fossil fuel companies or other companies that are uh, uh, where demand for their products is declining and placing more capital into companies and businesses that are addressing climate change. And Tesla is probably a good example of that having become the world's most valuable automobile company in that process. So these trends are really uh, affecting uh, investors and uh, are important from the perspective of climate change. So the real question is not uh, what's happened in the last couple of years, but what's gonna happen in the future, since as investors are starting to think about the future. And um, what's going to happen in the future is a decarbonization of the global economy. The greenhouse gas emissions that have been increasing every year will soon have to start decreasing. Uh, this is from the report of the IPCC. This is the UN uh, body that collects all the work of scientists all over the world. And what they predict is that in order to keep warming to no more than two degrees Celsius, greenhouse gas emissions, the CO2 emissions have to decline to zero within the next 30 to 50 years. Uh, now, this is a pretty challenging uh, task because we've grown greenhouse gas emissions uh, almost every year since the Industrial Revolution. For about 300 years, we've been increasing greenhouse gas emissions. And now we have about 30 years to decrease uh, those emissions to, to zero. So the question is, how, how do we actually do that? Which brings us to what we call climate solutions. In other words, what are the products and businesses that one can invest in that allow us to decarbonize to net zero? And there are many ways to think about this, um, but this is quite a useful um, tool for thinking about decarbonization. It's something called the carbon abatement cost curve. It's, it's an economic tool, but it's, it's widely used today. It was actually first created by uh, McKinsey back in 2007. And what this curve shows us is two things. If you look at the, uh, the Y axis, this is the measure the cost to reduce a ton of CO2 or CO2 equivalent, so how expensive it is to reduce the emissions. And the x-axis shows us how many tons we can reduce through that, through that product. So let me give you an example. Oh, just before I get to that, total greenhouse gas emissions everywhere in the world are a little over 50 uh, billion tons, actually about 52, 53 billion tons of CO2 a year, what they call gigatons, that's a billion tons of CO2. 
So that's the x-axis. So that's what we have to reduce. We have to get that 52 billion tons to zero. To give you an example, the, uh, the bar in the, the orange, it's called power generation. This is switching from fossil fuels, uh, coal primarily, to um, uh, eventually to renewable energy, to wind and solar and hydro. And we see that that bar, that orange bar is, is quite wide. There's, there's a wide orange bar. That means we can reduce a lot of tons through that climate solution, and we can do it at quite low cost. And if we look at this overall picture, you know, the whole curve, we step back, we can put it in two, two parts, two boxes. That's why there are boxes around it. The box on the left shows us that we can reduce about 50%, not quite 50% of all the emissions at very low cost. In other words, those solutions like renewable energy exist and they're quite cheap to implement. And then the box on the right, are solutions that exist, but are very expensive to implement. In other words, the carbon abatement cost curve shows us is, first of all, we have climate solutions to reduce about 90% of our emissions today and get about 85 or 90% of the way to zero. We have the technology. And about half of that is very cheap. The other half, not yet, not cheap. So that's the first point about the carbon abatement cost curve. The second point I would make about it is that it's not static. This is a uh, this is the curve when it was calculated, and this was calculated by Goldman Sachs, but many many companies, uh, many advisory firms, uh, do the same analysis. Is that it's not static; it changes. So this curve, the one I just showed you, is calculated in 2020 based on technologies and costs in 2020. This is the, at the same time, Goldman Sachs' estimate for that cost curve in the future. So the red line is the one I just showed you. That's just, the, just measuring the top of those bars. What Goldman Sachs is estimating is that the cost of those solutions is going to decline each year. And it almost certainly will decline. The cost of technology almost always goes down year after year. And so as long as those costs keep coming down, over time, we will be able to reduce more greenhouse emissions at lower cost faster. And that's what the carbon abatement cost curve shows us. It's very important to understand how much we can reduce CO2 emissions and at what cost. So our climate solutions are many. There's, there's many, many ways we can reduce emissions. And those solutions are coming down quite quickly in cost, which is very important for us as investors. If we add up all of the capital required over the next three decades, next 30 years, to decarbonize the global economy, in other words, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to zero, that total number is somewhere around 100 to $150 trillion. It's a big number. It's a very large number. Although, if we think about it every year, it's not so much. It's about 3 to $5 trillion per year in additional investment. So that's the amount of capital that's going to be required. That's the amount of capital that's starting to flow into climate solutions. So now let's talk about investor strategies for putting that capital to work. And the first of those strategies is simply risk management. And again, here we, we see Mark Carney, um, where he writes about the catastrophic norms of the future and the tail risks of today. What investors are starting to recognize is that while many of the effects of climate change are many years in the future, they're starting to affect asset prices today. And you're starting to see businesses pull capital away from assets that are at risk. For example, real estate that's at risk of flooding in Miami is starting to see some lower values. So some investors are simply uh, using uh, risk management tools and when they look at risk, they're looking at two types of risks. The first are what we call physical risks of climate change. And physical risks are two types. Uh, the first is acute risks, what we call uh, basically uh, storms, hurricanes, things like this. And then we have chronic risks, which are things like rising sea levels or changing uh, temperatures, heat. So they evaluate physical risks, but in many cases, it's actually the transition risks 
that are the biggest for investors. Transitional risks include policy risks when governments change policies because of climate change. Technology risks. Technology is when um, you know a new a new innovation comes that to makes an older product uh, uh, lose value. Uh, it changes the markets because of changing consumer behaviors. And then, of course, reputational risk as uh, consumer preferences shift. For businesses operating today, these transition risks are quite significant in many industries. So some investors are thinking about risk management. How do they reduce the risk in their investment portfolio? Key points on risk management. I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on this. By the way, these slides, uh, Gustavo, uh, uh, did I send you these slides? If not, I'll send them to you afterwards so you can share them if anybody wishes to have a copy. That's fine. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, the key point here is that, you know, until pretty recent, until a few years ago, investors were not thinking much about climate change risk. Now financial firms are starting to, to focus on this, on this issue. And that la the last bullet point here is financial regulators are also starting to focus on climate risk. In uh, Europe, there are significant regulations uh, requiring financial firms to measure climate risk. And here in the, S here in the US, the SEC is um, considering issuing regulations for reporting climate risk. They haven't made a decision yet about that. Okay, that's the first investor strategy. And the second strategy is a completely different one. It's called divestment. It's uh, deciding not to invest in uh, companies that uh, emit significant greenhouse gases like coal or uh, oil companies. Uh, the, the concept of divestment is promoted by uh, an academic named Bill McKibben, uh, an American who uh, also has a nonprofit called 350.org. And the concept of divestment is quite simple. It's, it's the concept, if it's wrong to wreck the climate, then it's wrong to profit from that wreckage. And uh, divestment is a very simple investment strategy because it's not investing, it's actually divesting. It's, uh, it's looking at investment portfolio and selling the, uh, the investments, the assets in companies that are, are heavy polluters, uh, like oil and gas. Um, divestment has become quite popular among a group of invest investors, primarily uh, philanthropies, educational institutions like Columbia University, some government pension funds, and, and, and some others. It's it's generally not quite so active in um, in uh, investment funds uh, that are you know for uh, fiduciary investment funds. Uh, but it's grown quite a lot and today, about $15 trillion in value of in institutions divest in today. And quite a few, quite a few of them have done that. It's a very simple strategy, it's simply refusing to buy gears and fossil fuel companies. Uh, it definitely raises attention on issues like climate change, but it actually doesn't have much impact. It, it doesn't really have much effect at all um, because Anyone who sells shares is simply selling them to someone else who buys those shares. And so it's a secondary market transaction. It does say raise issues of uh, morality uh, um, and whether or not fossil, you know, what, what is the value of fossil fuels? So in this sense, it's, a, it's an interesting strategy. And the big problem with the investment is that investors lose the ability to influence management. So uh, people divest fossil fuel shares because they don't like the fact those companies are contributing to climate change. But once you sell those shares, you no longer have any influence on those companies. Which brings us to the third uh, strategy, and that's uh, what we call ESG investing or ESG, very uh, much more common strategy today. Uh, ESG investing was actually proposed initially by the, the UN, um, by Kofi Annan when he was UN Secretary General, uh, which is a bit surprising to people. And, uh, since it was first begun, it was begun around 2004, the very first ESG investors. Um, and the assets that were following ESG initiatives uh, have grown very dramatically since then. This is uh, over $100 trillion in assets. Follow ESG principles. And ESG principles are really quite simple. It's, um, it's simply incorporate 
incorporating environmental, social, and governance factors into investment decisions. That's really all ESG investing is. But it's become extremely controversial, especially here in the US. And so you, uh, we have a situation today in the US, it started about a year ago, but continues to go where um, politicians on the right wing are um, very uh, unhappy with ESG and are um, attacking investment firms that follow ESG practices uh, because they don't want capital moving away from fossil fuels and politicians on the left attacking ESG investors because they feel ESG has not been effective at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And so uh, companies like BlackRock have found themselves in the middle of this, uh, what's called culture war on ESG. And uh, this has become quite problematic for investors using this strategy. The key points around ESG, it's simply incorporating these environmental and social and governance factors into the analysis of investment opportunities. Uh, academic studies show that incorporating these factors can in fact improve investor performance. It, it turns out that ESG investing might be a smart investing strategy. It's simply a strategy that says, when I make an investment, I consider all factors, including environmental factors, since that's an important thing to understand. The impact of ESG investing in climate change is raise awareness and attention on climate change. It encourages companies and others to focus on climate change, but it doesn't directly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And then as I mentioned a minute ago, these ESG wars are a problem between the right wing and the left wing politicians. We, we see something similar a little bit in Europe as well, but it's much more uh, a bigger, bigger issue in the US. And the real problem with ESG is that there's very little regulation around it. Uh, in Europe, we're starting to see regulations on, on ESG. The US regulated it. Uh, here in the US, it's unregulated. And uh, that's part of the problem. Okay, the fourth out of the five investing strategies. Uh, the fourth one's thematic climate investing. And thematic investing is the idea you can invest in a business or a company that's addressing climate change and make a, a good financial return that you can build a great company that also addresses climate change. DBL Partners is one of the early thematic climate investors. And thematic climate investors tend to pick a sector and then invest specifically in that sector. And it's two big sectors today for thematic climate investors are renewable energy and uh, electric transportation, electric vehicles. These are where most thematic investments are going today. Thematic investing has become a very large sector over a trillion dollars in investments targeted in very specific sectors that help us address climate change. And the fact, if we look at how much capital is being invested as of last year, uh, coincidentally, the amount of capital invested in uh, clean energy solutions reached the amount of capital, this is globally everywhere in the world, uh, invest in fossil fuels. So for the first time ever, um, you see that balance in capital investment. And thematic climate investing used to be done by small firms that were not widely known. These are little companies like TBL. It's a very small fund, maybe a couple hundred million dollars under management. Today, thematic climate investing is done by pretty much all of the very, very large investment funds um, in the US and globally. They all have these thematic climate funds. Two points here. It's a strategy of investing in a specific decarbonization sector, like investing in solar energy projects. It can have real significant impacts on climate change because the capital invested is used to create products that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Unlike, say, divestment or unlike ESG, thematic investing is really direct investing in greenhouse gas solutions. It's usually an early stage companies, early stage venture capital or growth equity, um, but sometimes it's, it's in a fund structure. And investing in these thematic companies can be very successful for investors. It's um, by aligning sort of value, the values of the investors with the business models of the companies 
can can be quite uh, quite profitable. Which brings us to our last uh, investor strategy, and that's what we call impact first investing. And impact first investing is an unusual form of investing because impact first investing means that the investor cares more about the impact than the financial return. In other words, investors willing to take a lower return or maybe wait a longer time to get their money back or maybe take more risk. Uh, impact first investing <clears throat> can never be done by a fiduciary who manages other people's money because it's not maximizing financial returns. So impact first investing is only used by uh, high net worth uh, individuals. Uh, people like Bill Gates is a very well-known impact first investor. He founded a a fund called Breakthrough Energy with his money, put a billion dollars into that fund. And that fund makes very, very risky investments in climate solutions. And the key point here is he's willing to take a, a, a below market risk adjusted return. He's willing to make investments that most investors just won't do. Uh, there are many ways you can below market return, take on more risk or a longer time frame or um, investing in uncertain government regulations. There are relatively few impact first investors, right? Since fiduciaries cannot be impact first, this very much limits who can do this. But they can have a very significant impact because they can invest in technologies that others can't. For example, Bill Gates is a very big investor in what's called SMR nuclear. This is the newest version of nuclear power. Uh, very, very risky. Uh, but if he's right, SMR nuclear will be an important climate solution, and ultimately he will make a significant profit from those kind of investments. Okay, so that's a review of investment strategies, um, which brings us to will we avoid catastrophic climate change? Catastrophic climate change is a warming of more than two degrees Celsius, and we call this catastrophic not so much because we know with certainty it'll be a catastrophe, but because it's likely to be a catastrophe because we simply don't know what will happen of a warming of more two degrees. The, uh, it's very hard to predict <laughs> the changes that will come at that point, um, but many of them could be very, very serious. The question really is, will we keep warming to no more than two degrees Celsius? And the answer is maybe, which isn't a very satisfying answer, because it really depends on the timing of investment in climate solutions. Right. And that's not just my prediction, that's actually a prediction of, uh, of the UN and the New York Times did a headline on this when the UN report came out last year. Stopping climate change is doable, but time is short. The, the, the real problem we have in addressing climate change is not can we reduce greenhouse gas emissions to zero. We, we have the technologies to do that and the cost of those is coming down quickly. The real question is will we implement those solutions quickly enough to decarbonize fast enough to keep the warming below two degrees. And in order to do that, <clears throat> we have to invest significantly more capital, significantly more quickly. And if we look at where we have to invest it, we have to essentially triple the amount of capital going into uh, electricity generation in particular um, in the coming in the coming decades. We will see very, very rapid increase in investment capital if we're going to avoid catastrophic climate change. In total, it's probably increasing in capital flows about three to six times by 2030. So within seven years, you'll see a very rapid increase in capital flowing to these areas. Uh, the good news is that that capital exists. There is sufficient global capital to do that. Uh, if we look, look at how large the capital markets are. Uh, the challenge here, and this uh, refers to Brazil as well, is that the gap in those capital flows is widest in developing countries. And uh, some developing countries, I would say Brazil, India, China, the gap is not so wide. There's a lot of capital really, uh, available but there's still a gap uh, in the poor developing countries, say Sub-Saharan Africa, that gap is very large today and it's unclear um, if, it will, if it will close. Let me just wrap up with implications for investors. What does all this mean for investors? 
Um, the, the first implication is that if we look for the next uh, 30 years, climate change is going to impact pretty much every business everywhere on the planet. The de decarbonization of the um, global economy is going to create a lot of winners and a lot of losers in nearly every sector, just as technology has in the last three decades. So we think about what's really affected business in the last three decades. Where's, where's, where's money been made and money been lost in the last three decades? It's mostly around technology. You know, three decades ago, um, if you looked at the uh, five most valuable companies in the world, there wasn't a single tech company in there. Uh, today, if you look at the five most valuable companies in the world, four of them are technology. So you see a, a, a very big change in, in, in valuations. Uh, if we look forward for the next 30 years, um, climate change is going to affect a lot of business value and it's going to affect a lot of investments in the coming years. And the second main implication for investors is that this what we call low carbon transition is this move from emitting greenhouse gases to reducing them eventually to zero. It's going to provide this opportunity to challenge a lifetime. It's sort of a once a once in a lifetime macro change in investing opportunities. And that's both a tremendous opportunity for investors to pick the next company. So they're going to, so the next Tesla, let's say, uh, in the years to come. But also creates an enormous challenge for investors as well. And the key is that investors rising to that challenge is critical for it to avoid catastrophic climate change. In other words, if investors do not invest capital quickly in this in this decarbonization of the global economy, we will not avoid catastrophic climate change. It's really all about how fast investors uh, take advantage of the situation. Um, it's not just investors, by the way. I uh, just had this quote from my uh, my colleague, uh, Dean McLaris. Um, uh, Dean McLaris is a relatively new dean at the business school. He joined us uh, four years ago as dean. And um, he's really come to believe that climate change is going to really affect not just the global economy, but what we do at Columbia, how we teach uh, business in the years to come. And so he thinks it's very important that we uh, we focus on this issue. Uh, his background is in technology, so he knows a lot about transformational change uh, in the economy. And he views climate change as, as technology has changed the economy. He views climate change in the future of changing the economy. And it's also I wrote the book that uh, Gustavo mentioned uh, in the introduction, Invest in the Era of Climate Change. Um, the book's been very well received. Um, rated highly by by by, uh, by people who've read it, and uh, it's all about the fact that uh, over the next thirty years, investing will change as a result of climate change. And that's the end of my presentation. I have to take any questions people have. Thank you very much. We already have a question on the chat, but uh, Ori, please feel free to open your microphone and, and ask your question. I think it's. It's, it's barely this way. Thank you. Are you guys hearing me? Yes, perfect. Good. So I'm not uh, doing video uh, because my camera is not working, but I can do. So thank you, Professor, for the uh, great talk. Uh, the question I have is on the agency problem. So if I understand correctly, uh, uh, those who don't invest in climate benefit as much as those who do. So they get market returns while the, those that invest in, in climate gets below market returns and they benefit the same. So what's the kind of state of the art thinking to address that kind of problem? Yeah, so I think there's two there's two uh, ways of thinking about agency costs. The one is, um, or two solutions to agency costs. The one is a government role, right? The role of government is to step in and, and solve agency costs. And to a certain extent, governments have done that. So for example, here in the United States, the Inflation Reduction Act, very much um, the subsidies it provides to companies that reduce emissions are so large that those businesses are now highly profitable in many cases. And so there is no agency cost for investing, say, in solar power or electric vehicles in the U.S. So the, the problem goes away. 
in places where you don't have government action to to address that issue, it's 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 more complicated. I would say in some cases the agency cost uh, doesn't exist because um, even with the additional costs, that the business you know is still successful. And um, you know a good example of that would be uh, in parts of the world where it's. Uh, <laughs> Very windy or very sunny. Uh, even with the additional cost of renewable power, they can it can compete with fossil fuels in those places without government subsidy today. And then there's places where there's nothing you can do about that, right? There is a cost, and there's no government support. And that's really the role of of the investors that I call impact first investors. And these are investors who are willing to take on that additional risk or that additional cost. Now those are very specific niches and doesn't apply. You know, you can't do that everywhere. Um, that's a good question. It's it's not 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 a simple answer though. Uh, any other questions or or thoughts or any anything happy to share? Any any uh, other points of view? Um, it doesn't have to be a question. I, I do have a question, Professor. Uh, I'll jump in. So first of all, thank you for the presentation. Um, on your book, you mentioned that there's a whole chapter regarding to financial assets and financial investing strategy. Can you explore a little bit more what are your perspectives and what we should be more concerned when looking for financial assets? So the, the, the issue of financial assets um, is that I think that the big challenge for investors today is they don't always know what they're getting, which has always been the case of financial assets. In other words, um, you know, if you put your uh, investment into a fund, or an ETF, you know, what, what are you actually getting in that fund or that ETF? And I think this especially applies to ESG funds or ESG uh, ETFs. And the problem with ESG is it's not well defined. Um, ESG simply says, I'll think about, you know, I will consider these environmental, social, and governance factors when I make my investments. But it doesn't, um, doesn't, doesn't tell investors exactly how that will be done. And so, there are many people who have bought ESG funds thinking that those funds are really directed on the environmental factors like climate change. And if they look closely at the fund, what they find is actually the investment looks very much like any other investment fund. There's very small changes in those funds. It almost looks like the S&P 500 or some other global benchmark MSCI. So the first problem is the funds don't they're not they're in many cases they call the ESG, but there's nothing special about them. Um, and the second issue is the um, the tools that investors have available to them to evaluate these funds uh, are not very effective today. So there's um, companies like MSCI and S and P and other ratings organizations have now tools for evaluating ESG. But they're they're really they really don't work very well. They're very ineffective. So what I would say on these financial products is um, a little bit buyer beware. I think a lot of investors don't realize what's in those products without looking very closely at them. Uh, another example, completely different market would be uh, green bonds. Green bonds, a bond issued by a company that then takes those proceeds and invests them, uses them in part of their business to make it green, lower emissions. Uh, the problem with green bonds, again, there's sort of no regulation, there's no rules. And um, some of those green bonds are not really very green. <laughs> um, there's really not, uh, the, the investment capital isn't being used all that wisely for addressing climate change. So again, the you know investor beware when you, when you, when you buy financial assets, uh, financial products, in this sector, it's still all quite new, and um, because it's because it's essentially unregulated, uh, you have to be aware of what you're getting. Uh, any other questions or or, or, or comments? I, mean, I think we have just a few minutes left, actually. I don't know uh, time. Uh, yeah. Professor yeah. Usher, this is uh, Harry Harry Chen. How are you? Good. I'm glad to to see you're working hard on this this topic here. <laughs> Big concern for everybody. <laughs> Uh, can you comment a bit on carbon credit and how it uh, will help uh, reduce uh, 
I mean, that seems to be a way for a lot of us to invest in ESG, you know, carbon credits. Yeah, easier. yeah, carbon credits. Yeah, it's a good question, and I did not address in my presentation. Um, so here's the important thing about carbon credits. Carbon credits is an important and necessary tool for addressing climate change because what a carbon credit does it allows a company that's able to reduce emissions very quickly and cheaply to do it and get paid by another company who cannot reduce emissions quickly and cheaply. And if we think that we need to get to zero emissions quickly, uh, carbon credits can be very, very helpful to help us get there. And um, in theory, carbon credits allow investors to invest in credits that will very, very um, quickly reduce our emissions at low cost. The problem with carbon credits, Harry, is again, <laughs> I've said this a couple of times, but it certainly applies here, is that's unregulated market. And so um, you have a lot of carbon credit projects today that the sellers uh, say that the project reduces the emissions. And in fact, it does not, uh, or reduces only partially compared to what was promised. And there's really no penalty. Uh, there's no government body that can enforce and ensure that the carbon credit is actually reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And this is a problem. So on the one hand, we need carbon credits to address climate change. And it's a good investment opportunity. In theory, in practice, the carbon credit markets today are um, really risky and mostly uh, not very helpful at reducing true emissions. The solution to that is to have some form of regulation. By the way, I keep saying regulation. You know, that suggests that I like regulation. Actually, I don't like regulation. <laughs> I'm in the, from the world of business and investment. But Regulation is almost always necessary in the field of, of finance and investment because if you don't have any regulation, you almost always have a bad outcome. Uh, the classic example here in the United States is, you know, almost almost 100 years ago now, the stock market was unregulated and uh, it worked fine until 1929 when it collapsed. And it collapsed because enough, you couldn't rely on any of the information. The financial reports were meaningless. The accounting was was didn't mean anything. People people lied and cheated in the finances because there was no regulation. Now we have a regulated market and it functions very well. So you can see, think the same thing of carbon credits. Without regulation, it's just uh, these markets are unreliable. Uh, with some form of government regulation, I think we can create some very reliable effective carbon markets. The challenge is who would regulate these markets because what you really need is sort of an international regulator, but uh, this doesn't really exist and that, that might be difficult. You need something like the WTO for trade. We need something like that for carbon credits. So it's going to be quite difficult to actually establish that. Anyhow, so you asked me a simple question, Aaron, and I, I went off on a long response, <laughs> but um, it's, it's a carbon credit is very important, but very complex. Is there uh, one, one last question? I have a question, Professor. Well, first, thank you very much for your presentation. How do you see, considering the development of technology, the fast development, uh, how do you see the risk, if there is any risk, in investing in wrong technologies? Uh, for example, uh, we are talking about the electric car as the tendency but you have green hydrogen coming along, which seems to be far more efficient than, than the electric car uh, and much less polluting. Uh, what is your opinion? Yeah. yeah, so to answer your question, what I think about the risk of investing in technology is a big risk. <laughs> but this is, you know, this is the risk of investing in, in venture capital, essentially, right? Investing in business before the technology is, is proven, uh, not just proven, from a technical perspective, but proven from a commercial perspective. So green hydrogen, just for everyone on that Zoom, green hydrogen is, is producing hydrogen using renewable energy and splitting, splitting the uh, water using electrolyzer to create hydrogen and oxygen. It is uh, environmentally friendly because there's no greenhouse gas emissions and the resulting product hydrogen is very useful 
fuel. We can use it in uh, heavy industry. We can use it in transportation. We can use it in uh, uh, heating. We can use it in a lot of applications. The problem with green hydrogen is it's very expensive to produce it today. Okay, it's about six times the cost of producing hydrogen using uh, natural gas, which is polluting. So the bet, if you invest in green hydrogen, is that you can bring down the cost quickly by a factor of six, and that you can invest, or someone will invest in infrastructure to move the hydrogen, because hydrogen is difficult to transport. You need new pipes, you need new everything. I'm simplifying the situation a little bit, but you, you understand the basics. So as an investor, um, you know, when my students ask me today, what's the most exciting sector to invest in? If you're wanting to have, you know, do something very big and very exciting, I say green hydrogen because it's extremely risky as an investor. It may never come down enough in cost. We may never build enough infrastructure. But if it is successful, it will revolutionize big parts of the energy sector. It, it could be the next uh, equivalent of the oil and gas industry. It could be a very large business and, uh, and an environmentally uh, beneficial business. It's too early today we have to know whether or not uh, green hydrogen will be a good investment opportunity. It's, it's, uh, we'll know that maybe 10 years from now. Yeah. But you know, I would say the same thing with electric vehicles. You know, when, in, in 15 years ago, when, when Tesla, was, and there's some other companies started electric vehicles, nobody imagined this would become a, a successful business. Electric vehicles are very expensive. There was no infrastructure for charging them. Um, it was unclear if any consumers would actually buy an electric vehicle, except a few, you know, a few crazy environmentalists. Um, today we know that the electric vehicles will soon replace all automobiles. It's a very, very good product, and the cost has become almost equal now in cost. Green hydrogen, I don't know, I don't know, but that makes it exciting. <laughs> Thank you. And there are many other technologies, not, not just green hydrogen. I mentioned uh, SMR nuclear, and carbon capture technologies, direct air capture technologies. There are many technologies today, many climate solutions that are um, could turn out to be some of the best investments ever made, or they could be complete waste. No, nobody knows at this point. That's, uh, that's for young people like Gustavo to figure out for us, and, uh, and we'll know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think I think we're pretty much out of time here. Um, I have to go and uh, I have to go to Colombia. I have to get some uh, some things done. But uh, always a, a real pleasure to speak with people interested in this topic. Thank you, Professor, for the, your time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, I hope this is the first of several. So if you guys have ideas of topics, share with us, and let's keep in touch. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great Enjoy trip. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.